So this week we are going to talk about instruction set uh, as first part, and after that we're gonna look at memory uh, technologies, memory hierarchy. So here's the um, second lecture uh, on instruction set. We're gonna talk about instruction formats, uh, operands, the types of operands, um, size, um, location of operands and addressing modes. Uh, those are all important elements of uh, instruction set uh, for microprocessor. Instruction set or instruction set architecture is the structure of a computer that a machine language programmer must understand to write a correct program for that machine. So as you know that each um, processor, each families of processors uh, have unique instruction set and often time processors from different vendors they uh, don't use the same instruction set uh, for example ARM processors have uh, ARM specific instructions and Intel's uh, microprocessors use uh, x86 instruction set so there are different kinds of instruction sets uh, it's hard to compare them uh, because each has its own benefits and history. Um, so, but we want to look at uh, what are the components, what are the factors uh, will make a good instruction set. Uh, there are two things, um, implementability and programmability. So implementability is, uh, by the um, where do we know that we have to implement this instruction set once we define it. So the physical processor after manufacture, uh, it has to uh, be able to uh, implement these um, predefined instruction set. Uh, it has to support uh, low to high performance implementations. Um, low means that it's easy uh, to trap to software to emulate complex instructions, uh, high performance uh, implementations, meaning we can employ these advanced techniques such as high planning, parallelism, and dynamic scheduling for higher performance implementations. For programmability, um, it's also easy to understand. Um, you have to have an instruction set that uh, can be easily understood by programmers because eventually programmers, especially assembly language programmers, they have to be able to use these instructions to write their program. Um, if a programmer uses high-level languages, then he or she has to rely on compilers. So the designers of compilers are also required to understand the instruction set and be able to program the compilers um, for this particular instruction set. Um, pre to 19... 80s, um, it's the instruction set uh, very much close to high-level language semantics. Um, it is because there's no good compilers. You have to de design an instruction set that can be easily understood by human and also um, allow human um, programmers to write assembly language programs. Once compiler techniques matured, um, the compiler um, can support different kinds of instruction set. So as a result, uh, a high-level program can be compiled into different um, binaries for different instruction set. Um, so as a result, the you know, question? Um, implementability and programmability like kind of sounds similar. So, a good question. So, implementability is more uh, concerned for chip designers. So, for a chip designer, uh, when you build this chip, design this chip, in order for this chip to support certain instruction set, you have to consider different options. Uh, you can uh, implement a instruction set using very primitive techniques uh, without using 
for example, pipe planning without using parallelism, you can implement an instruction set. But the outcome is that uh, that implementation will not have uh, as good as performance as the um, uh, implementation that incorporate these advanced techniques. So implementability is more of, um, more of a concern to the chip designers. Whereas programmability um, is concerning that uh, for yeah, for defining such an instruction set, um, how well can this instruction set be used by programmers? Uh, in the early days, uh, pre-1980s, the instruction sets are defined in a way that it's very much uh, similar to high-level languages. So you may not have uh, those um, um, standalone registers or may not have so many different instructions, uh, for example, move, load, store, those uh, instructions. Um, as the compiler technology advances, the later instruction set are more reduced or um, it's designed in a way that even though it may not be very convenient for a programmer to write using such instruction set, but because there's always compilers available for such instruction set, so high-level language programmers will be able to use this instruction set, not directly, but through the compiler. Um, the other thing, when people design instruction set, uh, they have to consider how to maintain compatibility. Compatibility uh, is to make sure that all previous written software will still work. Uh, this is a very big uh, issue when you move from one instruction set to a more advanced, more, more refined instruction set. It's primarily driven by the business uh, requirement because people have invented invest so much in software so they should be able to run the same software on new processors with new instruction set. Um, the software cost is actually greater than hardware cost. If you require the users or the customers uh, to rewrite all the software um, before they can use this new processor then you're going to face a lot of um, obstacles for pushing this new processor or new instruction set because people have to reinvent the view. They have to spend a lot of manpower and money on um, rewrite or recompile the software. Um, one possibility one to, is to um, resolve this issue is, is to reserve trap hooks to emulate future instruction set extensions. So what does an instruction set have to define or specify? These are the following, these, the following things should be specified in an instruction set. Instruction format, um, the length, the encoding method. So with a binary instruction, um, you should be able to, or the, at least the machine should be able to interpret each field of the instruction, the upper code, uh, operand, uh, etc. For the operands, uh, you have to define data types and sizes. And also, uh, for the upper code, you need to define the operation of the instruction, the function of the, that instruction. Also, you need to be able to tell where these operands are. So that's related to the location of operands and the result. There are different locations for storing operands and result. For example, registers and memories. So how do you specify 
uh, which register. And if it is a memory operand, where is the um, operand in memory? What is the address? There has to be control instructions as well in this instruction set because you have to be able to uh, change the program execution path in order to add um, structures like loop uh, or if then else branches. On the left, uh, I think this is something you are familiar with. Uh, this is a typical um, stages uh, of a instruction execution process. So you start from instruction fetch and then this instruction is decoded and after that you know which operand to fetch and then uh, you execute that operation on these operands. And finally the result will be stored into the destination um, register or memory location. And after that you're gonna fetch the next instruction uh, and this um, procedure continues. There are many different ways to uh, specify an instruction. Um, for the length of the instruction, you may see these different types, different ways to um, encode an instruction. You can have fixed length instructions, you can have uh, variable length instructions, and um, a comp comp compromise between these two is hybrid. For fixed length instructions, each instruction has the same length, either 32-bit or 64-bit or any um, length that the processor may choose to use. For example, PIC microcontrollers, they have 14-bit instructions. The benefit of using fixed length instruction is that the decoding becomes much simpler. Because you know, you when you fetch that many uh, bits, you know you got an instruction and you can um, figure out what is the operal code, what is the operands um, from that fixed length instruction. Um, but the drawback is that it's less compact. Uh, this is compared with the variable length instruction. Uh, the other benefit of using the fixed length is the um, easy pipelining um, superscalar architectures because you have unique um, you have unified length and that means you can decode the instruction in a unit time and you should be able to figure out what is the this upper code and how this instruction will go through the pipeline uh, provided that you have a um, end stage pipeline defined. For variable length instructions um, you don't know exactly uh, what is in that instruction is or, or what is the length of that instruction until you finish reading and decoding that instruction. So what happens is you oftentimes for these verbal length instructions you need to decode and read at the same time. Because after you decode the first byte you may find out oh this is an instruction that could be um, two bytes or three bytes more so you read more. Um, from the memory. The benefit of using this verbal length instructions uh, is uh, you can have a more compact program. You can um, use shorter instructions for those operations that do not uh, require these many bits. Uh, and the difficulty of doing this verbal length instruction is the decoding and also uh, for pipeline operations. The compromise between these two is the hybrid. Um, in this category, a instruction um, from an instruction set may choose uh, one of the different kinds of length. Uh, usually this could be uh, two or three different kind, different lengths, such as 32-bit um, or 16-bit or 64-bit and a instruction can only be one of these three um, different lengths. For example, uh, in recent uh, ARM processors, uh, they not only have 32-bit fixed length, they also have 16-bit um, instructions. 
Yes. Uh, in case of like variable or uh, hybrid uh, kind of instruction format, yeah. how does a processor know like, what mechanism is used to find out, okay, the instruction is say like four bytes or the instruction is say eight bytes? Okay, so it's gonna be similar to the variable length. So from the first byte, you you have maybe two bits used to specify the length of this instruction. So you know that um, for this particular instruction, you actually need four bytes rather than two bytes to decode it. Okay, so one particular bit or particular number of bits is is used just to determine the size of the instruction. Yeah. So for fixed length instructions, the first category, you don't have to encode such information because you know it's always that many bits. Right. We talked about the three different kinds of uh, instruction format. Um, this slide discuss uh, how that format uh, have impact on code size. Um, by code size, we mean the size of the executable. If the code size is more important, uh, we'll need to use variable length instructions because variable length instructions uh, are actually uh, defined in such a way that every instruction uh, has exactly that many bits to encode all the information it needs. If for a binary um, executable, the performance is more important, um, then use fixed length instruction is better because it saves uh, a lot of overhead on decoding. Also, it improves the performance of pipelining. Some recent embedded microprocessors like ARM, MIPS, they add optional mode to execute subset of 16-bit uh, wide instructions. Um, some other architectures um, um, employ on-the-fly compression for more density. For example, PowerPC um, microprocessors compress code in memory and decompress the instruction cache using special hardware. Also, the branch targets are handled uh, through address mapping uh, for uncompressed and compressed code. Um, so there are some special features used by um, different processors to reduce the size of the binary. Um, for the operations of an instruction, uh, we often see these many kinds, data movement, arithmetic, shift, logical, uh, control, subroutine, etc. Um, some string and graphics instructions or operations are specific to different processors. Uh, you may not see these operations available in every different architecture. Here is uh, interesting statistics on the instruction set uh, distribution. Uh, different kinds of instructions uh, have different popularity uh, in workloads. And these are average numbers um, calculated from um, benchmarks. Uh, for example, for this particular benchmark set, uh, loading instruction is the most used instruction at 22%, and call and return instruction are uh, the least used instructions in this workload. These numbers are not uh, universal, this is just um, for a particular workload. For media and signal processing processors, um, a tactic called SIMD, or single instruction multiple data, uh, is often used uh, because uh, for these media and signal processing um, processors, the algorithms that it executes often uh, work on multiple data by using the same operation. For example, if you have a picture, you apply the same um, operation on each pixel. Uh, if you do masking, you do um, some kind of uh, graphic processing. So that's why this SIMD is often um, available in these um, processors. Um, for 
digital signal processing, um, the some specific requirement uh, will have impact on how the processors in instruction set is defined. For example, um, because there are often real-time requirements on these applications, so there's no exception handling for arithmetic overflow. Um, also, there's um, specifics on multiply accumulate instructions. And for uh, floating point, uh, there are different rounding modes for uh, very wide accumulators. So there are many specifics uh, for DSP processors. Data types and sizes. Uh, we want to first distinguish software types from hardware types. Uh, software types refers to the property of a variable and a constant. For example, if you say um, unsigned integer uh, in C program, um, uh, you, or you say um, floating point um, variable X uh, in the C program. Uh, but here we're talking about uh, hardware types hardware uh, data types. Um, this is the property of an operation. Um, the most common data types uh, here, uh, byte wide, uh, half word, word, or double word. Uh, for floating point, we're talking about single precision, double precision. Yes? Um, I don't understand what's doing the property of an operation. Um, okay. Well, the hardware type is, um, for example, if you do a um, addition, you can do the addition on two byte-wide operands, uh, or you can do addition on two uh, word-wide operands. So that's the, the property uh, we're talking about here. Um, so the operation itself will, um, the instruction, if you look, uh, look at the instruction, from that instruction, you should be able to tell uh, whether this operation is working on uh, two bytes or it's doing uh, addition on two um, words. So that's the property of an operation we refer to here. Okay, for fixed point uh, types, we have um, signed or unsigned and as you can see that we use um, different operands uh, for specifying different operations. Uh, so the types of operation, in fact, determines the data types. Um, so for example, uh, ADDU is different from ADD because ADDU will treat the two operands as unsigned numbers. Um, for media and signal processing, we have um, special um, types, um, vertex, uh, which has, in fact, three properties, X, Y, Z coordinates, and pixels will have uh, RGB and uh, um, um, A is, I think, it's amplitude, not sure about the A. Uh, but you can use 32-bit to represent a pixel, and that's uh, a special type of operands for media and signal processing. Um, in the next two slides, we're going to look at the location of operands and results. Uh, we're going to go from stack-based um, um, location, and then we can look at accumulator and register memory, and then the next slide is about register, register. Um, the first kinds of uh, um, architecture, uh, stack type of machine, uh, was very popular in the early stage of the um, processor, um, early days. It stores everything in a stack. Uh, as we'll see in the, I think, uh, let me forward to here. Okay. Um, 
let me just go through this slide before we uh, look at the illustration. So the first one, the stack, is that you don't really have a memory, uh, rather you have a stack. As you know, um, stack refers to a special memory region that you push data in and pop data out. Okay? And also it's first thing last out. Right? If you um, um, picture that um, special memory region. The way this machine or this processor works is that it takes operands from the top of stack. So what you see here is this is the top of stack plus next as the next um, uh, um, variable to the top of stack uh, variable or data. It takes these two operands, uh, do the operation, and put the result to the top of stack. So let me move on to this picture here. So as you can see, this is the processor. The operation, the ALU operation, is done on two operands, and both of them are from stack. One is the top of stack, and the other one is the one next to the top of stack. The result of this operation is going to be pushed back to the top of stack. Okay. That's how the ALU operation is done. Now, there is a memory, but you need to use um, specific separate memory um, data move instructions to move data to top of stack. But the operation, we're talking about the operation, the operands are both from the stack. Okay, so this is the stack um, type of machine. The second one is the accumulator. Uh, this is where you have um, one special register called accumulator. And you can get the other operand from memory. Um, for example, you can do this operand A, getting that from memory, and that will be used uh, as the second operand together with ACC, the accumulator, to do the operation, and then the result goes into accumulator. So, uh, also, you can do um, using this X as a displacement. So you go to a different location and then get the memory operand and do the operation and put the result into the accumulator. This again has very good code density. Uh, the reason we say they have co a good code density is because you, if you look at the instruction, what you encode is only the operation and the address. And if you look at the previous one, the stack, it only encodes the operation. So that's why you don't need that many bits to uh, encode actual information. So from the code size or code density point of view, these two are good. But the drawback of these first two is that you have um, um, bottleneck and memory. Um, also, for the stack operations, you, you can't really do the pipelining because the stack are always, always busy. Um, the third type is the register memory type. It's an extension of the accumulator. Um, what you can do is uh, you can ha have two addresses. Um, you can do add A and B and put the result into A, or you can use actually three addresses to do B plus C and put the result into A. And one of them could be memory operand. So let's look at the illustration here. Um, so this is the register memory. This box here, this is the register. Okay. This is the processor itself. And this box below, this is the memory um, off chip. So the ALU can happen on 
a register and the other operand could be coming from memory. The third, I mean, the fourth type is the register to register. Uh, many recent processors use this type. So you can do um, two registers and put the result into the third register. Uh, you use load and store instructions to transfer data between the memory and register. You gotta encode many information. For example, here you need to encode the ID of the registers, you need to encode the memory location, um, the ID of the register. Uh, it supports operant uh, symmetry. Uh, as here, you see that you can um, re kind of swap these two um, registers by having the same result. Um, it's, it has deterministic length of ALU operations. Because for ALU operations, you know that all the operands, including the result, are going to be in registers. So there will be no um, misses on the, on the cache. There will be no delays for memory accesses. Also, uh, there are scheduling opportunities. Uh, you can use compilers to shift these instructions around to take advantage of the um, some um, novel techniques example, um, uh, branch prediction, uh, these techniques um, in the processor. So we showed these four different types of machines, and they have different bytes per instruction, different number of instructions, and cycles per instruction if they are used to implement the same function or same algorithm. This is an example. If we want to do, for example, um, the sum of these two numbers, A and B, and put the result into C, and these are the code, assembly language code, um, that we need to write for these different types of machines. Uh, let me just um, point out this. For example, for stack machines, uh, since the machine can only do operations on the stack-based operands, so you need to first put these two operands, two data value, to the stack, and then you do the operation, and then you get a result back. For register, register um, instructions, uh, you need more. Um, well, compared to register memory, you need load the data from memory to the register R1. Similarly, you need load uh, the second operand into R2 and then you do addition, and then you store the result uh, in back to memory. So you can see that uh, for the same operation, they will use different number of instructions, and the instructions they use, they have a different length. The length of the instruction can be estimated by uh, counting the number of operands and the types of operand. For example, um, this instruction uh, has R1A, A is the memory uh, address, and uh, these three operands, they are all uh, registers, so you need to only store the ID of the register, which is really uh, very short. General purpose registers. After 1980, uh, almost all machines use general purpose registers. Uh, the advantage of the general purpose registers uh, include uh, speed. Uh, these registers are on chip uh, based on uh, very uh, fast uh, storage technique, mostly uh, SRAM. They are faster than off chip memory. Um, also, these general purpose registers are easier for a compiler to use. Uh, because you don't have to consider how different this register is from another one. All these general purpose registers are the same. And these registers can be written and, uh, um, and read for uh, any uh, cycle, and they can hold variables. As a result, the memory traffic is reduced, 
so the program uh, performance is improved. For the code density, we also gain because uh, using registers, we only need to store their identifiers. Uh, if you have, say, 32 general purpose registers, um, the number of bits you need to use to identify the register is five. This is the table that uh, compares different types of architecture and in terms of the number of memory addresses and also the maximum number of operands. Um, these are recent machines, um, although some of the processors um, uh, in fact already disappeared because the um, technology in advance. Um, for example, Spark processors are kind of um, disappear from the market and uh, the VAX machines are also um, um, part of the history. But this table shows you that different type of architecture, uh, for example, register, register, register memory, uh, they end up having different number of um, memory addresses and also they have a different number of operands uh, supported. Okay, we now want to look at memory addressing uh, because for um, all the machines, um, they have to deal with memory. So either way, um, using load store instructions or uh, register memory type of instructions, they all have to specify an address. There are two questions uh, we need to consider when designing an instruction set. If you want to load a 32-bit word, um, how do you load it? The machine can load four bytes uh, sequentially, I mean, using four load, each load loads a byte only, or it can load a word using a single byte address. In that case, um, how do we map the words to the byte addresses? That's the first question. And this question is related to uh, endings. The second question we need to answer is, uh, can or cannot a word to pla be placed on any byte boundary? Um, this second question is related to alignment. Endings is the order of bytes in words. There are essentially two ways of doing this order of bytes. One is called big endian, the other one is called little endian. Big endian stores the most significant byte in the byte with the littlest address. And little endian is the opposite. It's gonna store the most significant byte in the byte with the biggest address. So what we see here is for example, we want to store this 32-bit word, okay? Uh, D, A, D, B, E, F. And we want to store the address, the byte address, starting from this one zero 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 zero, And starting from this address, we know we're gonna put these four bytes. And the following address is uh, one zero 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 one and then one zero 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 two and then the last address or the highest address is one zero 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 three and if we look at this thirty two bit word we know that the most significant byte is d e And for little endian, we're going to store the most significant byte in the highest address. So out of these four, this is the highest address. And following that, we're going to store the next uh, most significant byte 
AD here and B here and EF here. So this is the little endian. So if a machine uses little endian, that is to say, when the processor loads a word from this address, the processor needs to interpret that word by treating this byte as the most significant byte and this byte as the least significant byte. For big NDM machines, the order is the opposite. So it has the most significant byte in the lowest address or in the smallest address. Um, for Intel processors, um, they use little endian. So the, what you're going to find is the most significant byte of a word is going to be at the highest address. The second question um, is re related to memory alignment. We know that memory is byte addressable. Um, as a result, a 32-bit word will actually take four contiguous locations or four contiguous byte locations of main memory. So what we see here, we have, um, suppose each box is 8-bit uh, data or byte, and these are the addresses. So we have 12 locations starting from 0 all the way to 11. So here we have three words. And these three words are called aligned words because if we draw a line here and here, these are the word boundaries. Okay? Um, and all these words are within the boundary. So this is called a line. Now, if you have a word starting from 1, that's going to take 1, 2, and 3, 4, and this word across this boundary here. And that's what we call unaligned word. These unaligned words will cause um, performance penalties because when the processor is connected to memory, it has, in this case, a 32-bit data bus and the decoding of the memory address is um, strictly on the boundary of these um, word boundaries. For a misaligned word, it has to use extra bus cycle to get the extra byte um, in the following um, bus cycle. So um, the red line here shows the misaligned word I just talked about. It sits across this boundary, so the first three bytes are going to be loaded in one bus cycle, and the last byte will be loaded in the following bus cycle. So total, it takes two bus cycles as opposed to one bus cycle um, for um, this misaligned words. Addressing modes um, refers to how the processor um, is going to calculate the location or the address um, of an operand. The very first one is the register-based addressing mode. Uh, that means all the operands are from registers. And we have immediate, so that uh, um, means one of the operands is a number. And we have displacement, which means that we're going to use um, one of the operand, R1, as the address plus this uh, displacement or offset. And we have, um, for example, here, uh, memory indirect. Uh, this is uh, uh, two levels of uh, indirectness. So we're going to use R3 as the um, address to load another address from memory and use that address to access a different memory location. So for different processors, they may include 
uh, these different kinds of addressing modes. Also for specific application specific processors, for example, DSV processors, they may have additional addressing modes, for example, circular buffer uh, access uh, for this um, uh, FFT uh, transform. And it's because these um, functions or these instructions are used very often for uh, DSP applications. This is uh, another uh, case study. Um, it takes uh, benchmarks from spec um, instruction, um, benchmark suite. Uh, there are three benchmark applications uh, analyzed. Um, what it is shown here is that for different benchmarks, how many instructions uh, using different types of addressing mode. For example, memory indirect uh, was used 60% for the SPICE benchmark, 1% for GCC. Uh, for the SPICE benchmark displacement memory addressing mode is the most, is 55%. Uh, compared to 32% uh, for uh, tax uh, benchmark. Uh, short summary here, uh, data addressing modes are important, um, including register, register, displacement, immediate. Um, the size of the displacement should be 12 to 16 bits in order to um, access a wide range of memory space. Uh, for immediate, the size should be 8 or 16-bit, uh, as these are the common used values in these benchmarks. <coughs>